Good evening and welcome to the candidate forum for the 2020 District 7 San Francisco Board of Supervisors election. I'm Allison Go, the president of the League of Women Voters of San Francisco. And tonight, before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to remember the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She was a powerful advocate for women's rights and civil rights, arguing for equality regardless of age, race, sexual orientation, or gender. And she was a fierce defender of voting rights, authoring the famous dissent in Shelby County v. Holder that said gutting the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was, quote, like throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you're not getting wet. Justice Ginsburg's wisdom, determination, and dedication to, human, to equal rights embody the League's belief in the power of women to create a more perfect democracy. Our members would not be where we are today without the career long work of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. The League, of, the League of Women Voters of San Francisco is a nonpartisan political nonprofit that encourages informed and active participation in government. The League never supports or opposes candidates. However, however, we do take stands on issues. This year's election presents new and unprecedented challenges for voters, and we are committed to providing resources that voters need to exercise this most fundamental right of our democracy and be assured that their votes will be counted. Please remember that you must be registered to vote by October 19th. All registered voters will be mailed a ballot in, in early October and options for in-person voting will be available both early and on November 3rd. Please visit our website at lwvsf.org slash vote, where you will find all of the voter resources that we offer. The League of Women Voters is a nonprofit organization, and if you'd like to support our work in free events such as this one, please become a member or donate at our website at lwvsf.org. I'd like to thank our partner, the UCSF Community and Government Relations Department for their dedication to promoting voter education through their support of League initiatives, including tonight's candidate forum. I am now pleased to introduce Dee Moore, our moderator for tonight. Dee Moore serves as the membership co-chair for the League of Women Voters of San Francisco. She's retired from the startup industry where she held numerous positions in sales and marketing for over 15 years. She left the industry to raise her two children, and she has worked in our community as a volunteer for several organizations, including SF CASA, where she has served for over nine years to support youth while in foster care. Welcome, Dee. Thank you, Allison, and welcome to the candidates for San Francisco District 7 Board of Supervisors. This evening, the candidates will have a chance to present their views on issues affecting San Francisco and to answer questions that were submitted in advance about those issues. First, I'd like to remind you of the ground rules. Responses to questions should be on issues and policy related. Candidates are expected to be respectful of other candidates and asked to not make personal attacks on other individuals. That's the ground rules. Here are the procedures for the forum. The candidates will have the opportunity to make one minute opening and closing statements. Opening statements will be in alphabetical order by first name. Closing statements will be in reverse alphabetical order by first name. Each candidate will have one minute to answer questions. Any, re any rebuttals may be included in the candidate's closing statement, which will be one minute. Each question will be directed to three candidates, with each candidate having the opportunity to answer the same number of questions. The final question will be directed to all candidates. A countdown timer will be displayed with visual indication of the remaining time for a response. So please watch it carefully. And if you go over, I'll politely remind you. Every aspect of the forum will be equally fair to all candidates. Thank you to our attendees tonight. You are in listen only mode. The Q&A and chat features are not active. We collected your questions beforehand, so we won't be taking questions tonight. This forum will be recorded and made available on our website, our YouTube channel, and on SFGov TV cable channels. You have many important decisions to make on November 3rd. Tonight's forum 
will give you an opportunity to learn before you vote. So now let's begin. We'll start off with one minute opening statements in alphabetical order. Thank you candidates for participating in this forum. Please introduce yourself, tell us which neighborhood you live in and why you are running for District 7 Supervisor. We'll start alphabetically with Ben. Hello, good evening. Um, and thank you very much to the League uh, for hosting us tonight. Um, hello, my name is Ben Matranga and I'm running for District 7 Supervisor. Um, I wanna fight for working families and ensure that our city emerges from this health crisis stronger than before. Um, as a new father and a first time homeowner, I know the stakes are incredibly high in this election. Um, I know our city is calling out um, for genuine leadership, um, for a, a common sense, um, and for frankly, for people that'll deliver on their promises. Um, now let me tell you a little bit about my background. Um, I was born and raised in District 7. Um, I live in West Portal, uh, seven blocks from where I grew up. Uh, I met my wife in high school at St. Ignatius. We're raising our young daughter um, very close to where we grew up. Um, district 7 is an incredible special place. Um, we have deep roots in the district. And I think what matters uh, to so many folks is that um, we preserve that opportunity, but we also expand it. Um, and uh, professionally, I've spent 15 years building uh, large scale. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. And now we'll move to Emily. You're muted, Emily. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Emily Murase, and I want to be your District 7 supervisor. 2020 marks the centennial of a woman's right to vote. And yet, after the departure of Supervisor Fewer, who is not seeking re-election, we will be left with just two women on the 11-member Board of Supervisors. I seek to become the first woman elected to represent District 7 at City Hall. I'm the best candidate because I have the most experience and the best ideas. I've served in the city for over 20 years under five mayors, most recently as Department on the Status of Women, where I was director for 15 years. I'm the only candidate who's been elected to office serving two terms on the school board, including as president. My spouse and I have lived in the Lakeshore neighborhood of District 7 for over 15 years, where we raised our two now adult daughters. My platform priorities are th strengthening thriving neighborhoods, bolstering public safety and public health, and accelerating economic growth. Thank you, Emily. We'll now move to Joel. Hi, everyone. I'm Joel Engardio. I live near Lake Merced with my husband, Lionel. We love our West Side neighborhood, but we worry about San Francisco's future because City Hall has ignored families for too long. Families care about the basics, housing, schools, quality of life. The budget has doubled the past decade and nothing is twice as good. Uh, and now we're facing massive deficits. So we need to audit every program and only pay for what works. Uh, I grew up in the General Motors factory town of Saginaw, Michigan. My mom cleaned houses for a living. Uh, I was raised by my single mom and grandmother. They didn't have a lot of money or education, but they taught me how to get things done by being smart with the resources we have. San Francisco can really use those lessons right now. Uh, I've lived in San Francisco for 22 years, lived in District 7 for a decade. Uh, as a journalist, I held City Hall accountable and gave people a voice. I'll do the same as your supervisor. It's time to get the basics right, clean streets, less crime, and better services. I'm Joel Lingardio and, and would love to have your number one vote. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. Next will be Kenneth. Hi, thank you very much for having me today. It's a pleasure to be here and I, I'm glad to have the opportunity to be able to speak my mind. So my name is Ken Piper. I've been in San Francisco 25 years. Uh, my fiance and I came here, a couple hundred bucks in our pocket. Uh, we lived off of every Muni Metro line and for the last 14 years have been homeowners in Westwood Park, just a couple houses up from Ocean Avenue in the heart of District 7. Uh, I feel, I feel I owe this city. I, I've never been a government employee, uh, but I've been very successful here. Both my wife and I were able to build careers, have three children. One's up at UC Davis, another's over at Lowell, and another one's at uh, uh, Buena Vista Horace Mann at a Spanish immersion school in the Mission. Uh, I feel like uh, because of uh, my experience with the public schools, with business, and with being a homeowner here in the city, I understand District 7 
very well. And like others, family's important. From cradle to grave, District 7 should be a place where anyone can live. Thank you. Thank you, Kenneth. Next will be Myrna. Hi, everyone. Good evening. My name is Myrna Melgar. I live in Ingleside Terraces, where I've lived for the past 10 years with my husband and our three daughters. Two years ago, we got another member of the family, Frankie. Um, I have worked in public service and community service my entire life on issues of affordable housing, community economic development, and workers' rights. I'm running because uh, our city is experiencing changes, um, the changes to our environment, to our global economy, and symptoms of uh, income inequality. I'm running because I want to use my skills and experience to help us plan for those changes. The policy decisions that we make today will have a profound effect on how we get out of this pandemic, how our recovery goes, and whether or not we continue to be a city of opportunity and that shining example that we have always been to the world. I, I would uh, appreciate your support. I am the candidate with the most experience. Thank you. Thank you, Marina. Next will be Stephen. You're muted. All right, gotcha. Steve Martin Pinto, uh, I live in Sunnyside. Uh, thank you for having me. I uh, just want to ask everybody one question. Is San Francisco better off than it was four years ago? Who's been in charge for the last several years? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm running on a campaign of common sense and straight talk. I'm running on a campaign which is far different from anybody anywhere else in the city. When I began my campaign, it was just me, myself, and I, and one promise. Tell it like it is and don't hold back. My campaign is quite literally groundbreaking. I've been one of the most successful non-democratic candidates in the last several decades. I, the reason why I've been successful because I quite literally uh, tell it like it is, I speak the truth and I have a lot of credibility. Uh, you know, I'm a firefighter, a fifth generation San Franciscan, a veteran of uh, Iraq and Afghanistan and the Marine Corps. And as somebody who's a first responder, I see the results of the homeless crisis every day. Uh, this November, please vote for me, vote for Common Sense, vote for Martin Pinto. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. And next will be Velasco. Hi, my name is Velasco Wynn, and um, my parents fled uh, the fall of Saigon, and my dad got his first job here in the United States as a longshoreman in Anchorage, Alaska, which is how I got my name. My parents put Vietnam and Alaska together, and that's why my name is Velasca. I loved growing up in a union household. Um, my mother worked the post office, uh, the graveyard shift her entire career. So they really instilled a deep value for public service and hard work. I came here to San Francisco uh, USF School of Law in 2001 where I met my wife. We currently live in Park Merced and our kids go to school, well they did before uh, the shelter in place, right across the street. Um, I am proud to have the top endorsements of our educators, teachers, nurses, and the Sierra Club. They see me as a champion to navigate through this unchartered territory and I ask that you allow me to be your champion at City Hall and stand up for working class families. Thank you, Velasca. Thank you all candidates. Um, we'll now move on to the questions for tonight's forum. Question number one, what types of initiatives will you support to increase housing availability in District 7? Do you agree with approaches that promote more housing density? If yes, which approaches? If no, what other approaches do you favor? And we will begin with Joel. And Joel, you have one minute. Hi, so there's three areas of District 7 where, there's, where more housing is coming, uh, Park Merced, uh, Balboa Reservoir, and Stonestown Mall. And so those are all appropriate areas for housing. I do not support anything that would restrict or eliminate single family zoning. Uh, we have more than 40 distinct neighborhoods and they're all unique and they're gems. Um, we have three transit corridors, by the way, served by muni trains, West Portal, Ocean Avenue, and Terravel. So there, I support putting more housing along those train lines because it's going to help revive our business districts and help them survive. Um, West Portal has a five-story Art Deco apartment building that's been there for 90 years. It's at the, at the far end. Um, we can match the height and look of that building without harming any single family neighborhoods. Um, 
We do have a need for elevator buildings for seniors so they can age safely in place without leaving the neighborhood they love. Uh, we have a need for middle income housing to keep families in San Francisco. And the housing along those, trains those train corridors can fill those needs. I'd also like to create a West Side housing plan. So Thank we make you. sure. Great. Next, we'll have Kenneth. Hi, thank you very much. So uh, Joel said a lot and, and I agree a lot with, with what he said. So the transit corridors and the density should be allowed to grow. Um, I'm not for Scott Wiener's bill. I have a big concern about the distance from those transit corridors and the ability to take away from the single family housing that exists here. Um, the more I read, the more concern I have over that bill. So I think we need to be smart about it. I think we just, uh, we just gave away the deal of the century Right, less than uh, $600,000 an acre for Balboa Terrace. So uh, I'm ready to put a stop to future development. I wanna see what's gonna come out of that and how that's actually gonna help District 7. That's a, that's a District 7 deal. So I wanna be smart. I wanna make sure we can have housing, but I wanna remind everyone, this is District 7. We are built on single family homes in small neighborhoods, and I do not wanna lose that character. So it has to be an equal balance. Thank you. Thank you, Kenneth. Next is Stephen. Okay, uh, so kind of what a lot of people have, have been saying, uh, I'm, I'm for uh, increasing density along transit corridors. I feel like there's plenty of space to develop or add a story or two to one story buildings along Ocean Avenue and West Portal. It wouldn't uh, change, it'd be minimal impact uh, to the neighborhood. It wouldn't change much of the character of the neighborhood if we do it right. Uh, but there's also one thing that I think we also need to address as well is what can we do to reduce demand? I think we really have a unique opportunity here because we found out that telecommuting is possible. Now, a recent survey said that two thirds of all tech workers would leave San Francisco if they could. There's a latent demand to get out of San Francisco. So if they have a chance to get out of San Francisco and live somewhere else but still work here, then they have the chance to do so. Uh, that lowers demand which would put downward pressure on home prices and uh, make it easier for those that want to live here to be able to afford houses. Thank you, Stephen. Now we'll move to question number two. How would you address providing more affordable housing in District 7? Do you support programs that encourage the building of more accessory dwelling units, commonly known as granny flats or in-law units? And we'll start with Myrna. Thank you for the question. Uh, yes, I absolutely support uh, building more uh, accessory dwelling units. Um, I will point out that just because we think it's a good idea and put together the legislation like the state has, it doesn't mean it, it actually will happen. I think we have to do more than that. We have to support homeowners to be able to adapt their structures and age in place while uh, using the space they no longer need to house someone else. And in order to do that, the city can help help by making the process easier, uh, friendlier, uh, more expeditious, and also helping with financing. That is the second part of adding more affordable opportunities. It's not just about development, it's also about money because access to financing is not equal in our society. If you are on a fixed income or uh, you're a woman or you're a, you know, a black person, you tend to have less access to the market. So I support all those things. Thank you. Thank you, Marina. Next will be Emily. Can you please repeat the question? Yes. How would you address providing more affordable housing in District 7? Do you support programs that encourage the building of more accessory dwelling units, commonly known as granny flats or in-law units? Yes, I do want to start out by saying D7 is primarily single family homes and that keeps families here not retreating to the suburbs. So it's a very important part of our um, contribution to this city. Uh, we have over 40 neighborhoods and that are very distinct from each other. Lakeshore is different from Forest Knolls, which is different from Westwood Park. Um, and within that, there's new state law that allows for two accessory dwelling units within a single property. 
Uh, I do think there's an opportunity to be creative, uh, not only ADUs, but also co-housing, um, other sort of ways to live together. Um, but primarily, uh, I am looking at the new developments for housing density. So Balboa Reservoir uh, promises 1,100 units, of which 50% will be affordable. Uh, Park Merced and Stonestown also uh, offer um, opportunities for uh, increasing density. Thank you, Emily. Next will be Velasca. I'm supportive of the idea of providing um, adjacent dwellings to provide more housing. My biggest concern is that uh, whether it'll make a significant impact in terms of providing the housing units we need. Uh, I, I think there are sites here in District 7 where we can begin from day one um, after the election to really dedicate affordable housing to the working class families like educators. Uh, back in 2018, the leadership of uh, UESF, our, our educators and teachers, actually identified a space that is uh, owned by the school district at 7th and Lawton for 100% educator affordable housing. This is the, the perfect scenario where we don't have to treat um, these issues like they're mutually exclusive, like compromising the unique character of District 7 while still building um, affordable housing that will actually make an impact and provide real housing in a time. Thank of you, crisis. Velasca. Okay, we'll move on to question number three. Will the planned closure of the Youth Guidance Center, also called the Juvenile Justice Center, provide an opportunity for increased housing in District 7? If yes, what types of uses would you favor? And we'll start with Ben. So the closing of YGC, I think it's the perfect example of the sugar high that we see at City Hall. Um, you know, I've walked through the facility two different times. Over half the Board of Supervisors voted on closing the facility and never even visited it. This is the kind of thing that happens all the time that frustrates people. Folks were chasing the headline to say um, we were going to close the facility, but didn't actually know kind of all the great programming, all the rehabilitation that was happening there. Um, if you talk to the, the folks uh, in capital planning, they say you can't reuse that site um, for different types of housing. So I think it's fiscally irresponsible um, to be able uh, to do that. It would cost too much. This, the taxpayers are still paying off the notes of participation on the rebuilding of YGC when it was done more than a decade ago. So we're still paying off that financing. We need to be thoughtful about how to keep the space so young kids can stay in San Francisco that need that rehabilitation. Thank you, Ben. Next will be Joel. Yeah, I don't think we should have closed it in the first place. Um, Juvenile Hall, you know, you know, is a place that has good programs that's like helping kids get back on their feet and be more productive members of society. Um, and we shouldn't give up on that. So uh, I would not want to put housing there. I don't think we should have closed it in the first place because ultimately you risk shipping kids out of county. That's not going to be helpful for them. And, and as I said, there, there were good programs there already. I think we need to be mindful of, about the use of the land all around that area, especially Laguna Honda as well, because there are a time might come where we need expansion of medical facilities. So we want to just make sure we are not um, using up land that, that uh, the hospital might need. Thank you, Joel. Next will be Kenneth. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, I think Ben hit it on the nose there. Uh, that is a sugar high. Uh, the idea that juvenile crime is, is down forever and, and we are in some magic wonderland. Um, the reality is, is we're heading into a recession that's already uh, shown its teeth. Uh, California is now flattening at 11% unemployment. Um, we know that during recession and in times of high unemployment, that crime does go up in particular with youth. Uh, we know uh, we likely have crested with the lows in violent crime that have existed. So the idea that magically we've solved our problems and we're going to be able to deal it without a juvenile hall, I think once again, uh, to use Ben's term, is a sugar high. So uh, I'm against the closing of it. And I do think it's one of these scenarios where uh, when we have a problem that manifests, we should look at fixing and solving that problem, not necessarily 
shutting it down. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kenneth. We'll move on to question number four. What are the primary issues regarding homelessness in District 7? What programs or services would you bring to the community to address these issues? And we'll start with Stephen. In my experience as a first responder, every day I go to work, I'm right there in the trenches dealing with homelessness. I worked at some of uh, San Francisco's busiest fire stations where I ran up to 20 or 30 calls a day, most of which were homeless calls. And in my experience, the homeless crisis in San Francisco is very much closely tied to a drug and mental health crisis. Uh, we have 300 fentanyl deaths nearly in 2018, 400, nearly 450 last year, and the number is on pace to be even higher this year. So one of the biggest things I think we can do to solve the homeless uh, problem, not only in District 7, but citywide, is really crack down on those drug dealers who are imprisoning people in a cycle of poverty, misery, and drug addiction. That, to me, is one of the biggest things we can do to start. The other thing I think we can do is really lobby for those increased conservatorship laws. And I'm willing to go to Sacramento to do that. Thank you, Stephen. Next will be Myrna. Thank you, Dee. Your question was about District 7. Um, and, you know, I just want to point out that District 7 is very different than District 6 or District 5 in terms of, you know, our homeless epidemic. The majority of the folks in District 7 who are experiencing homelessness are not drug addicts. They're working people living in their RVs and vans. Um, what we are experiencing is a profound lack of services. The other day, you know, my friend who owns a uh, coffee shop called and said there was a young woman who was, you know, on the street, had no place to go. And he was like, Mirna, who do I refer her to? In District 7, there's nothing. We don't have the mental health services, the access to wraparound services that exist in other districts. We desperately need them. And more than anything, we need a safe parking site where people can have showers and dispose of their waste so that it doesn't go into our storm uh, sewer drains and where people can be treated with dignity. That's where we need. Thank you. Thank you, Myrna. Next will be Emily. Yes, I believe strongly that it's a human rights violation to let people sleep on our streets. We're one of the wealthiest cities in the world. We really can't tolerate this situation anymore. Uh, unfortunately, homelessness is not just a D7 issue, it really is a citywide issue, and I've been on record as opposing locating a navigation center in D7 because it's too costly. The Embarcadero Navigation Center is $12.5 million of public funds for 200 cuts. And I maintain that uh, women, families, veterans are not well served by tents or cots. I advocate instead for the flexible housing subsidy pool at $11 million aims to provide 200 apartments with a door and a key and an address. And I want to make sure that women don't get lost in this. Domestic violence is the number one cause of homelessness on the streets. We need to fund anti-domestic violence services. Thank you, Emily. And we'll move to question number five. What programs do you support that address substance abuse and mental health issues for all of San Francisco residents? We'll start with Velasca. Mental Health SF, I think it is the most comprehensive program. Um, and if fully funded with the proper resources, we can actually make a really big difference in terms of uh, the visible impact on our streets. Uh, I think this goes hand in hand in terms of the meaningful reform that we want on the criminal justice level. If police officers can actually be focused on just reporting to crime, we can actually have social workers and folks who are really trained and know the nuances of uh, de-escalation and mental health crises intervention. And that really stems from Mental Health SF. And I think it is uh, a much needed program um, citywide. I think here in District 7, I, I think we can all echo uh, the same underlying issue is that, you know, the unhoused uh, issue is very different from the other districts, but that is one program and policy that I'm fully in support of. Thank you, Velasca. 
Next will be Ben. Uh, thank you. Um, I mean, I had a, um, a young kid that worked for me four years ago um, that died of a drug overdose. I was born and raised in San Francisco and died of a drug overdose um, on our streets in San Francisco just two months ago. Um, we have an epidemic um, on our streets. Um, we need to make sure we have treatment on demand um, and the services to actually deliver for folks like that. This is, you know, this is an issue that hits folks of all background, um, of all, um, um, uh, you know, of all neighborhoods, of all parts of the city. And I think um, the city's been slow to respond. Um, and you see it in the numbers, you see it in the, the rise in fentanyl deaths, but we're not going to get ahead of the problem unless we're proactive. Um, Mental Health SF is a great program, but in a lot of ways, it's a repackaging of programs that already existed. Um, and it's a slight expansion of some of the ones that were more effective. That's good, and it's a nice first step, and we certainly cut a ribbon and had a lot of nice things to say about it, but it really is just the first step forward, and I want to see a real commitment, and that's what I'll do as supervisor. Thank you, Ben. And next is Joel. Yeah, we will not solve our homelessness uh, crisis until we deal with the mental health crisis. So in San Francisco, there's something called the Behavioral Health Court, and this is uh, if a mentally ill person attacks someone uh, while having a psychotic episode uh, on the street, then uh, the court gives treatment instead of jail time. And this is a good thing because we do not want jails just to become de facto mental institutions. But the problem with the behavioral health court is that um, you don't get help until after you attack someone. And I think we should be helping people before they become violent. So that's why I support expanding conservatorship laws uh, this gives mandatory treatment to people suffering from extreme mental illness. Um, this doesn't mean going back to the awful days of Nurse Ratchet and uh, mental asylums. Uh, and I know that that's a show on Netflix right now and also a reference to a movie in the 70s. But we, it's not about that. It's about opening a new generation of mental health facilities that can uh, treat, give people the treatment they need. Thank you, Joel. We'll move to question number six. The increase in property crime, including bur burglaries and break-ins, have become a concern to many residents of District 7. What actions would you propose to residents, the police, and the city administration to handle the increase in property crimes? We'll start with Kenneth. Hi, thank you very much. Um, uh, our current District 7 supervisor and president of the board uh, held a meeting for our neighborhood. He lives here in Westwood Park. And um, I was surprised at uh, the feedback. It was specific to crime, exactly what you're asking about. And it was uh, predominantly property crime. Uh, and the conversation moved on to home invasion. And uh, what I could tell in that meeting was that people were scared. And they weren't scared for the actual activity that's occurring, but the change that's occurring now. And so you ask an excellent question, what should we be doing? First of all, I think we need to be much tougher on car break-ins and home invasions. Uh, I hear a lot of talk about how we need to help these people and I agree, but as soon as we have those property damages that actually scare people from wanting to go out to their car at night, from locking their door at night, triple locking, triple checking, we need to make sure that we have a beat cop on the street and my time is up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kenneth. And next is Stephen. So one of the things I think we can do right now as a community to help uh, make our neighborhoods more safe is uh, form neighborhood watch programs. And they've actually shown great success. Uh, there is a particular block in Diamond Heights where the neighborhood watch program is wired very tight and it's actually an anomaly of no crime in the middle of a neighborhood which has significant crime. So that's one thing we can do. The other thing we can do is uh, join programs such as SF Safe, which teaches neighbors how to uh, be safer and look out for each other. You know, I'm always a big proponent of hiring more police. I think we need to do that. I'm one of the few candidates who's gone on record uh, against the defunding the police movement. I think it's the wrong way to go. We need to hire more police and especially in, because of the increase of crime, uh, we need better training, we need more police, uh, and we need uh, to not forget the, uh, the crime that's happening. And thank you, time's up. Thank you, Stephen. Next, we'll hear from Myrna. 
Thank you. Uh, there have been other communities who have come up <clears throat> with really innovative community-based approaches to keep better eyes on the streets. Folks who uh, are embedded in the community know their neighbors, know the patterns, know the businesses. One program that I'm really fond of is in Chinatown. Uh, it's called the United Peace Collaborative. And it's uh, retired folks and young folks who have been trained uh, to do that. Uh, and they work in collaboration with the police so that when things are kind of off, um, they have the, uh, the person to call. Um, and then there is a partnership and a trust that has already been built with the community because folks are members of that community. So I am a big proponent of programs like that. They're actually quite cost effective um, and less violent uh, than, you know, having folks with uh, arms on the street, but it also are built on trust um, and a knowledge of the community and they're remarkably effective. Thank you, Mirna. Now we'll move to question number seven. How would you approach potential proposals to reallocate funds from policing, <clears throat> excuse me, to mental health and social services while still prioritizing public safety? And we'll start with Emily. So I've been on record uh, opposed to defunding police, disbanding police. Uh, we have had an uptick in property crime, home invasions. Um, there was a suspected arson of one of our local businesses, Dragon Printing. Uh, there was a robbery at uh, Miracle Cleaners on Ocean. Uh, so we can't expect immediate response if we're going to cut the police budget. Um, now, within the police budget, I do believe I'm very data-driven and evidence-based, and UC Berkeley did a study of foot patrols in the SFPD, and in 2018, when Chief Scott reassigned 70 officers to foot patrols, there was a tw almost 20% decline in theft and assault. So that's evidence-based intervention, so we need more foot patrols, um, we need uh, community policing, crime spotting technology and anti-bias training uh, in the police department. Thank you, Emily. And next is Velasca. Uh, yeah, I agree with some of the things that Emily raised. I think in, when we're talking about reallocating and being smart about our police budget, I touched upon it earlier. We don't need police officers responding to non-criminal mental health crises. There is a world where we can be smart about our police budget and actually have more visible foot patrol officers while reallocating that saved money uh, to folks and social workers at the Department of Public Health who can actually do the outreach for those individuals going through a mental health crisis. Um, it's unfortunate that we've gotten into this war of slogans over defunding the police, abolishing the police. But I think if we're truly committed to police accountability, we'll see our police budget a lot smaller because we're being smarter about our, our police budget and we can use that money uh, for mental health services that are much needed here in San Francisco. Thank you, Velasca. Next is Ben. It's, we can certainly all agree. Um, if you would have watched this same debate when I was growing up 20 plus years ago, it was the same concepts that came out. Let's have more beat officers. Oh, we want a beat officer on this street. Um, and over and over again, these things get promised and nothing gets delivered. There's certain facts. Right now, four out of 10 positions at Terravel Police Station are vacant. So if you have an auto burglary and there's, a, there's only two sector cars in the middle of the night and one's out at the ocean, and one of them, and you live all the way in Twin Peaks, the response time is gonna be 10 plus minutes. There's some very basic facts around response times and how that correlates to what our staffing is in, in the police department. Um, I think Chief Scott very eloquently when he was talking about the budget this year was accurate. We have a generation of older officers that are retiring. We want a police force that is more diverse, speaks multiple languages. We have young kids coming through the academy that have advanced degrees in criminology. We need to bring them into the police department. We only do that by funding the police department. Thank you, Ben. And now we'll move to question number eight. What types of services currently handled by the police would you support being transferred to other services? What specific plans for the changes would you require to be in place before the change is implemented? And we'll start with Joel. 
Well, I agree with uh, Joe Biden and, and Governor Newsom when they talk about reimagining the police and making them better. Um, so we should look at shifting at how police do their work. So calls involving homeless people or mentally ill people, um, they can be better handled by social workers. Um, we still need police to focus on the serious and most dangerous crimes. Um, I'm vice president of a victim's rights group called Stop Crime SF, uh, and I support police reforms. I also see that home burglaries are up 60% this year. Uh, homicides and um, firearm shootings are both up 30%. Uh, so we still need police to do the detective work. Uh, we need police to protect the public uh, and we can't forget about the victims of crime. Uh, so I do not believe in defunding or disbanding our police department. The New York Times recently featured our police department as a model of reform. So we should continue that progress and uh, that takes more resources and not less. Uh, but we should recruit new officers from diverse communities and only hire uh, officers who serve at the highest standard. Thank you, Joel. Next will be Kenneth. So uh, lots of smart people. Uh, I think if you vote for any of us, uh, you're going to get a good uh, supervisor. So uh, Velasca yeah, said it well, uh, you know, defunding the police is a bad term. It's a horrible term. It sounds like you want to get rid of them. Uh, reality is it's a reallocation. And so uh, I'm with uh, our current chief. He has some really good ideas and about how to uh, use funding for mental health and uh, domestic violence in particular. And I think those are two areas that absolutely we could have specialists in that could be that don't need to be uh, police. That being said, I am a metric driven individual. I come from the business side and I believe firmly that if we are going to allocate funds into just about anything, you track what occurs and then you make decisions about how successful it is. And if it doesn't meet the metrics that you put in place and the goals you put in place, you take that money back and you put it to better use. Thank you. Thank you, Kenneth. And next will be Steven. I wanna be very, very cautious about um, replacing police officers by mental health workers to deal with people with mental health crisis because Human nature is very, very unpredictable. And when you're high on drugs, even more so, and I have personal experience with this. I've been on multiple calls where people have overdosed and they're sedate, they're passed out. You give them Narcan and even the smallest person temporarily displays superhuman strength. And me as a first responder, I actually got injured by one of those such people. I was like, I'm fine now. It wasn't a big deal, but this is the thing is people can act very violently, very, very violently, very quickly. And a mental health worker alone by himself is not trained to deal with that. So while I'm not opposed to having mental health workers and homeless outreach team workers accompany police, I don't think that they should at ever time, any time be a total replacement for police. Thank you, Stephen. Now we'll move on to question number nine. How will you ensure that residents of District 7 have access to services and resources that will help them meet their basic needs as they struggle with the challenges of COVID-19? And we'll start with Mirna. Thanks for the question. Um, I think that District 7 um, has for many, many years been shortchanged in terms of the um, services that we receive. I think there's this perception at City Hall that we're all right, you know, we're wealthy, there's, you know, nothing that we need when in fact, uh, we have a very large population of uh, folks who are elderly, uh, immigrants, people who don't speak English. We're a quite diverse district that has a lot of needs. I think at the top of um, my priorities in terms of the services that you asked about, Dee, are food security. So when the pandemic started, um, we started the, the food bank that Emily um, has been working at and my daughter as well. Uh, we're in conjunction with the Marin County Food Bank at the YMCA. We thought 200 people were going to come and we had 700. So senior services, food security, family services, transportation, all of those services are needed in District 7 and I will prioritize them. Thank you. Thank you, Mirna. Next is Emily. Yeah, so um, 
among the 40 different neighborhoods in District 7, there are varying degrees of um, organization. So for example, I know Ben has worked very hard to uh, help the West Portal neighbors be organized. Miraloma Park is organized. Lakeshore was not very well organized. And so actually Joel, who's a neighbor, and I helped stand up Resilient Lakeshore. And we put out 1,200 door hangers with resources on COVID for our neighbors. And so I'd really like to uh, make sure that there is seed funding for every neighborhood to be able to band together, whether it's crime or COVID, uh, and really create community within the neighborhood. Uh, we have the strongest language access ordinance in the country, and we are obligated to provide services to English language learners uh, at the same level as as native speakers. So I will make sure that services, uh, for example, briefings by the police are in multiple languages. Thank you, Emily. And next is Velasca. I'm extremely proud of my criminal justice experience uh, being a public defender going on to my 16th year now. And every day I walk into court, uh, that is a phenomenal responsibility to pro provide a voice for those who are forgotten and marginalized. I think as an extension of my advocacy as a public defender, uh, we need a leader at City Hall who is going to speak up and advocate and really ensure that District 7 has all the resources uh, that our community needs. Um, Myrna and Emily touched upon some of our most vulnerable, particularly the elderly, and with uh, the population and community being comprised of 17% uh, Chinese, particularly a lot of elderly folks who don't have family support, we need to make sure we have every resource available to, available to make sure they're not isolated and to ensure that their well-being and health is taken care of during this pandemic. Thank you, Velasca. Now we'll move on to question number 10. What is your plan to bring back business and encourage new businesses in the West Portal and 9th and Irving shopping districts? We'll start with Ben. Thank you. And, and I would expand that question to include both Ocean Avenue, Lakeside, uh, Terraville out to 19th. Um, you know, our neighborhood commercial corridors um, are amazing. They are the envy of so many uh, areas of San Francisco, and they're a gathering place uh, for so many in our communities. And frankly, they're not getting enough attention. Um, and, um, you know, what we had early on in COVID, um, I helped set up the largest COVID-19 response effort in District 7. And one of the things we did right at the beginning was brought in the merchants because we knew how difficult it was going to be. We wanted to create um, direct linkage so neighbors could go to them as soon as they were open. That type of small business advocacy doesn't take place right now. Um, right now, you know, the city loves to tout being in partnership with small business. I'm a small business owner. I don't think anybody feels like the city is a genuine partner to them. And it comes from the uncertainty, the lack of clarity around regulations. Certainly there's a lot of fees that you just don't know about. Um, there's an opportunity to have clarity and I will certainly champion small business. Thank you, Ben. Next we'll hear from Joel. So even when the economy was booming, um, our small businesses were in trouble. We have to remember that last year, 500 restaurants closed in San Francisco. And why did that happen? It's because City Hall was killing small business with all of its permits and fees and regulations. Um, so we need to acknowledge that small businesses were dying before the pandemic because we cannot go back to the way things were. Um, the Chronicle reported that um, San Francisco is one of the most difficult cities to open a food truck. Uh, we should be the easiest city to open a food truck, especially in a, in a pandemic. Um, of course, you know, some regulation is, is necessary to keep people safe, but beyond that, um, we should let an entrepreneur with a good idea try anything they want, uh, give them a long runway to see if it works, um, and we need to foster that creativity uh, because we don't know what the great new idea is that's going to save our economy, but we want to make sure that we are creating the environment where that can happen and we're not stifling it. Thank you, Joel. Next, we'll hear from Kenneth. Hi, thank you. So uh, excellent points already from Joel and Ben. I'm very consistent. Um, I, I will tell you this, the, the San Francisco government does not see small business as a help to the city. They see it as a tax base. Uh, the burden to open up business is ridiculous in this city. It is easier 
There's less regulation to put a satellite in space in the state of California than it is to open a restaurant in the city of San Francisco. That's a bit of a joke. Uh, if Prop 13, this new amendment, um, passes on commercial development with triple net leases, uh, some of that burden is actually gonna be passed directly on to small businesses. So uh, the reality of the day is we have a lot to change. We've got a lot of regulation to get rid of. Uh, and the last thing I wanna bring up, and I don't know if anybody's hit on it yet, but this city may have changed. You take a look at what's happening downtown. I know it's not in our district, but look what's happening downtown. And if the office workers don't even come back to 80 to 90%, the small businesses there are going to get hurt and it's going to permeate itself through the city. Thank you, Kenneth. And next we'll move on to question number 11. There is concern that the California Environmental Quality Act, CEQA, regulations are being used to create significant delays in the review of city projects. How will you approach this issue? And we'll start with Stephen. Okay, so I, th I think that the uh, CEQA may have gotten a little bit uh, convoluted. It was meant to be uh, protecting the environment and uh, ensuring the well-being of uh, the people. But I, I feel like it's kind of become a little bit weaponized at times. Uh, people use it uh, to stop other businesses and uh, really kind of burden uh, new startups from ever happening. So one thing I would like to see is if there's a way to simplify the permit process, if there's a way to reduce redundancies, uh, yet still maintain a degree of having the community have an ability to, to speak on uh, behalf of their community if there's a new business coming in. I think we need to retain that, but I really feel like uh, we could do a lot to simplify the process to uh, reduce the uh, time that a business uh, spends in approval and um, really I think that would go a long way to helping uh, improving the economy and helping small business start up. Thank you Stephen. Next will be Myrna. CEQA is a good tool. It's an important tool. Uh, not only does it uh, help us protect the environment, it also helps protect if, uh, historic resources. Um, it can be cumbersome and lengthen the time that a project takes to completion. Uh, but I am a firm believer in democracy, and this is the way our communities have had a say uh, in whether we preserve something or we clean something up before something gets built. Uh, it is very important, and I think that we need to not shortcut it or um, cut people out of the process or only let the loudest voices and the people who have the most resources weigh in. I think we need to keep using it as a way that it was intended as a democratic tool for people to weigh in on development. Thank you. Thank you, Mirna. And next is Emily. Yes, so my approach generally is to listen and lead for our neighborhoods. So community stakeholder input is essential uh, in things like the CEQA. And uh, we're seeing sort of the negative impacts of environmental uh, unsustainable um, behaviors with the fires and with the pollution. So CEQA is very important. Uh, neighbors must have a say in things that go up in the neighborhoods. On the other hand, it shouldn't be the case that a single person can halt a project. So it was a big article in the Chronicle. Heather Knight suggested that appeals or objections should have the support of at least 50 people. I think that's a reasonable uh, threshold. It, it shouldn't be just one person. Thank you, Emily. Okay, we'll move on to question number 12. San Francisco has a significant deficit in the upcoming budget, which due to COVID-19 will likely persist in the future. What specific policies will you champion to address the likely current and future issues related to budget decisions? And we'll start with Velasco. Back in 2008, I remember being called into my um, office's conference room and I remember my boss uh, asking if anyone wanted to take an unpaid voluntary leave. And I remember being shocked, angry, and pretty scared for about a year as a relatively new lawyer practicing 
And I'm, I'm not comparing what we went through over a decade ago to this unprecedented pandemic, uh, but it did serve us uh, as some guidance in terms of the rainy day funds that we've prepared for this particular scenario. I mean, I'm looking out the window and it is absolutely pouring. If this is not the scenario to rely on those rainy day funds, I don't know what is. But we don't have to alone rely on these rainy day funds. There are revenue measures uh, that are on the ballot um, in November that can also allow us to navigate through this pandemic in a way where we can survive. Thank you, Velasca. Next, we'll hear from Ben. I think, you know, we're in the first inning of a, a likely financial crisis across the entire United States, certainly in the state of California, certainly in the city of San Francisco. Um, and the challenge is, you know, the District 7 supervisor has historically been a leader on the budget and really been a long-term thinker. Um, and I, I think fundamentally in this race, voters are voting for someone that's going to make trade-offs. Because in a city that has a $13.6 billion budget, there's $18 billion worth of asks. And that will always be the case. There will always be more asks than, than there are resources. Um, I come to the table with 15 years of experience spending money, allocating capital, and getting results for social causes, whether that's large scale affordable housing, whether that's building ports, whether that's expanding access to the internet. I think those skills are absolutely needed. There's a misconception a lot of times that we're somehow like one audit short of like, a, a, you know, better outcomes in homelessness. It is a workman's journey of everyday work. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Joel. So we have to acknowledge that the budget was too big to begin with. Uh, it doubled the past decade. Nothing is twice as good. Uh, and, you know, our population only grew by 10%. So, we have these deficits. We also have to remember that we were in the hole last year when the economy was good. And the reason is uh, City Hall just spends whatever it wants and it uses residents like a never ending ATM. So that's gotta stop. Party is over. Cities cannot borrow their way out of the debt, you know, like the federal government can. So the hard truth, we need to cut salaries and cut jobs just like Mayor Newsom did during the Great Recession 10 years ago. And back then, by the way, we had 26,000 employees, which was too many. Today, we have 40,000. This is not sustainable. Um, there's never gonna be enough revenue to, to keep our bloated budget where it is. Uh, we talk about rainy day funds. We could deplete, deplete them all and we still won't cover it. So it was irresponsible today for supervisors or yesterday to um, use our rainy day funds to give city workers raises. We should be freezing raises so we don't have to lay people off. Thank you, Joel. We'll move on to question number 13. Many residents take advantage of open space and nature for recreation and health benefits. How would you ensure that these resources are maintained, not only for District 7, but for all of San Franciscans? And we'll start with Kenneth. Hi, thank you. I really wish I could have answered that last question because I got a lot to say there, but thank you very much. So uh, certainly, uh, the open space here in the city is fantastic. Actually, in District 7, it's reasonably limited. Um, uh, and so um, I am a huge fan of the parks. I think the parks are one of the most wonderful things we have here in the city uh, that people can take advantage of. Golden Gate Park running from uh, the middle of the city all the way to the ocean. McLaren Park actually being the biggest city, the biggest park in the city uh, over here, uh, not too far from our district. Um, what I think we need to do is maintain them. Uh, there's been calls recently to be able to open up some of the non-used areas uh, for development, and I am completely against that. What I want to see is the ability to actually access them and for people to feel safe. I think it's one of the biggest issues for McLaren. You can look at it statistically as the biggest park in the city. It's hardly ever used. There's, a, there's safety concerns that exist there that really don't need to anymore. Uh, we need to promote uh, those parks and be able to fund them. Thank you. Thank you, Kenneth. Next, we'll hear from Stephen. All right, so I'm a, I'm a huge proponent of open space. Uh, as a kid, I grew up within walking walking distance of Mount Davidson, uh, Glen Canyon Park, one of the few creeks still left running through the city. And whatever we can do to preserve those uh, treasures, those precious few waterways, um, I'm all about it. One thing I do want to say is I think that some of our open spaces are looking a little bit rough, Mount Davidson in particular. 
It's overgrown with eucalyptus, thornberries, uh, ivy, and we could do a lot to clean it up. I think from a fire safety standpoint, that'd be a, a good thing. Not only that, if you open up and remove all those weeds, all those uh, ivy and thorn bushes, it would actually make it more accessible, accessible for more people to enjoy. Uh, you know, I, again, like there has been some talk about using some of our XX park space for development. I'm totally against that. We need to protect what remains. There's so little of it left. Thank you, Stephen. And next we'll hear from Mirna. Thank you. Um, I'm a little surprised, Kenneth, that you don't think we have a plethora of open space in District 7. We do. We have Lake Merced, we have Fort Funston, we have Mount Davidson, we have a lot of really great space. For the past uh, four years, I've been on the Planning Commission. I was the president for the last year. And in conjunction with the Recreation and Parks Department, we approved a plan for the maintenance of the wilderness areas and the areas that are open space around the city. And uh, as Stephen pointed out, you know, we uh, are experiencing some uh, non-native species that have taken over our parks. Like everything else in San Francisco, it is contentious, uh, whether we get rid of the eucalyptus, whether we, you know, uh, support the native species, but I do think that there's a process and we're well on our way. I uh, support keeping them as open space. I don't support development of the open spaces. They're crucial and they're what attracts family and make um, District 7 a wonderful place to live. Thank you, Mirna. We'll move on to question number 14. What types of policies would you support that would reduce the level of emissions in San Francisco from vehicles powered by fossil fuels? First, we'll hear from Emily. Thank you for that question. Uh, we need to encourage uh, public transit. Hopefully um, we can get Muni back to where it once was uh, post COVID. Uh, we need to encourage additional bike traffic. Um, since the pandemic, I've become an avid uh, if in expert cyclist, uh, we need to encourage walking. Um, but I also want to acknowledge that there are some folks in the community who have to rely on cars. Um, perhaps there are people with disabilities, perhaps they're seniors, uh, families with young children. So I don't envision a 100% car free environment, but I would like to see more options. Uh, for example, for rental bikes, if there are families that can't afford uh, to rent those bikes, uh, we should subsidize those really and encourage um, bike traffic. Um, we also need to address our eating habits. I'm a big proponent of meatless Mondays in our schools, perhaps for the city, and to buy local. Thank you, Emily. And next we'll hear from Velasca. I like meatless Mondays. I think I'm going to start adopting that. Um, I, I think we need to get to a point in our city where uh, taking public transportation is the preference um, in terms of efficiency and the first choice. I mean, I, I drive my minivan and my two kids around out of necessity, and I, I don't like this dichotomy where um, people are blamed for relying on their cars out here in District 7. I think we have a long way to go in terms of really improving our infrastructure and public transportation. It seems oftentimes that we're at the beginning stages of really improving and having uh, mass transit that we can all rely on. So I think there is a world where we can get there. It's gonna take a lot of work. Uh, but I think in terms of, you know, starting with Meatless Mondays and then really taking this as a top priority in terms of improving our infrastructure uh, will go a long way, uh, but we can get there. Thank you, Velasca. Next we'll hear from Ben. Now, I'm uh, a father and have a young daughter who's 15 months old. And when I think about um, our city, and I think about our planet, um, you know, it, it rightfully causes alarms for, for everyone. If you look at the wildfires that are raging across the state of California, um, and I think there is concern about that. And I think, you know, we do need to be proactive and San Francisco has consistently take, uh, taken a leadership approach on this. Um, I think one of the key elements is um, actually pushing towards a transit first city and, and how that becomes possible is when Muni is clean, safe and reliable. Um, it, it's very simple, you know, for 15 years, when everyone looks at the uh, ridership surveys, it says clean, safe, and reliable. And right now, 
you know, even before the pandemic hit, people did not feel that way on Muni. We have an opportunity right now um, to be able to change a lot of the things that were wrong about the transportation system and move toward that. It starts with replacing some of the basics and that's what I'll champion. Thank you, Ben. Final question for all candidates. What would be your top three priorities for your term as supervisor? And what is the boldest idea that you think that you will bring to the table? And so this is for all candidates and we'll start with Kenneth. Great, I really like this question. Thank you very much. So, um, so, uh, I, I, so accountability, um, we could talk. Uh, how much time do I have? It's just one minute. So I got a lot to say. So accountability on the budget. The budget was a joke that was just passed. It's based upon data. The tax base is not going to come in. If we don't pass all these revenue deals come November, it's going to be a disaster. And I think we need to hold this, these supervisors accountable, but of course they won't be held accountable. Um, the, the one big plan I would like to see done is I want to make every elected official in the city of San Francisco take mass transit, public transit, for 80% of their work and be fined if they do not. Because if, this, if these public officials do not back public transit, they don't have a willingness to ride that public transit, then they should vote that way when they're in office. So I'm all for every elected official taking public transportation for 80% of their work and fines if not. Thank you. Thank you, Kenneth. Now we'll hear from Mirna. Thank you, Dee. Um, actually, the boldest idea that I have is that we are going to have a woman as a supervisor for District 7. That's pretty bold. It would be the first time that that's happened. Um, I also have lots of ideas about housing production. Um, I think that uh, we are remarkably uncreative with how we do this. Um, the biggest uh, area where I think that we could make progress is in workforce housing. We have a lot of major employers in San Francisco that uh, don't have this as part of their business plan. I think folks could, uh, you know, put some of their money into a fund that would be more flexible and more patient than what we can get from Wells Fargo Bank and get the benefit of produ producing uh, housing for their workforce. I think it's an idea that uh, needs you know, infrastructure and capacity and I intend to put, push it forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mirna. Next we'll hear from Velasquez. It's uh, extremely scary to see what our environment's going to look like in the next 10 years. And we need to start really focusing on environmental justice if we're going to take care of our city and our, our environment. Um, I believe that working class families really make this city go. So ensuring that working class families can afford uh, to live here and earn a living wage is going to be a top priority. But being a public defender, um, I am proud of my work in terms of criminal justice reform. I think on day one, one of my boldest um, plans would actually be to write policy that would uh, essentially outline police officers not responding to non-criminal offenses. And I think that would be a first step in terms of really improving our police department, but ensuring the safety of our community. Thank you, Velasca. Next, we'll hear from Emily. Yes, <clears throat> so modeled after President Obama's American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, I would uh, call for a San Francisco Recovery and Reinvestment Ordinance. Um, the bold part of this is I ask my colleagues, uh, the mayor, to set aside political differences and work towards a single goal of getting San Francisco uh, back uh, on track to get businesses reopened, get people back to work. Uh, I would call for expanding childcare resources, uh, investing in neighborhoods, uh, more foot patrols. Um, but another big idea would be um, universal free Wi-Fi. Uh, to have it be government owned, but um, bid out the operations. I wouldn't want the government to run the Wi-Fi system, uh, but this universal free Wi-Fi could be an engine for new businesses, new connections, incubate uh, uh, new economic activity. Thank you, Emily. And next we'll hear from Ben. 
you know, the boldest thing that I would do is actually deliver. I think all of the things we care about in San Francisco, the fundamental challenge is the announcement and then the day after, nothing seems to go forward at the same pace. And I think, you know, what we see in a lot of these debates and at City Hall is what I like to call policy popcorn. It's like idea, idea, idea. And the challenge is, is that we don't necessarily need new ideas to solve some of the problems. So all the big challenges that we have in San Francisco, whether it's homelessness, whether it's tackling corruption and contracting, whether it's really pushing back against affordability, it takes follow through. It takes experience and it takes showing up every day. One of the things I tell everyone is I work for you. And I think a lot of times we have supervisors that are chasing that next announcement, not chasing the end result that's gonna make your life better. So I'm fighting and I'm running to be able to deliver on that. Thank you, Ben. Next we'll hear from Steven. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> I got a couple of, uh, I think pretty big ideas. Well, first of all, I think the three biggest issues that are facing, that we're facing right now in San Francisco is corruption, homelessness, and crime. So for the corruption part of it, one thing I want to do, which is I think is pretty bold, is call for term limits. Two terms and you're done forever. We have John Avalos, Aaron Peskin that have served before and now they're running again. I feel like they've had their time in the sun. Now it's time to step down and let somebody else new take the spotlight for a bit. As far as crime goes, I want to recall our DA. I'm going to say it outright right now. I think he's failing us as a DA. It's time to get somebody in there who actually knows what the job is, is not afraid to do it. And for homelessness, I want to have stronger conservatorship laws. That's kind of above us as a city. But again, I'm willing to go to Sacramento with other like-minded city council members across the state and lobby and force to get it. Thank you, Stephen. And finally, we'll hear from Joel. So we're facing a lot of challenges exacerbated by the pandemic, but this is an opportunity and I think we need to really get City Hall to focus, focus, focus on the basics. Clean streets, less crime, better services. Uh, we haven't been getting those right for a long time. So until we get those right, everything else is a distraction. We, we need to take this time to focus. As far as the big idea, I want fiber for all. And I'm not talking about the fiber you eat. I'm talking about internet fiber. Uh, we're all on Zoom right now and you see often frozen faces and people dropping off. It's really important with everyone working from home, work has changed forever because of the pandemic. Uh, we need fiber infrastructure and it's something basic. I think fiber is the 21st century version of filling potholes. I think City Hall should create the system. Uh, we shouldn't run it, uh, but we should lease it out to private enterprise and make money on it and then make sure that everyone has access through subsidies because this is what's going to save our economy and it will allow us to be plugged in and open for business. So that's the bold idea. Thank you, Joel. Uh, that concludes our questions for this evening. And now we come to the candidates' closing statements. We will do the closing statements in reverse alphabetical order. And remember that you have one minute. And we will start with Velasquez. When we're thinking about who uh, the supervisor is going to be for District 7, I think it really comes down to who do you trust as a leader to represent the voices here in District 7? And also who is going to be strong enough and unafraid to push against the status quo? Uh, I am proud to be the only candidate that is supportive of having a navigation center in District 7. Um, I was equally as proud to be the candidate to uh, support um, Supervisor Marr's public advocate. I think this is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of what we're going to see uh, as the corruption unfolds and more individuals are indicted. Um, and I also am extremely proud that when I started my campaign, I was the only candidate that objected to the mayor's uh, nominee of the police commission uh, a prosecutor who wasn't dedicated to criminal justice reform. I am the leader because I am unafraid to take bold action and represent the folks out here. Thank in you, Velasquez. You're welcome. Thanks. Now we'll hear from Stephen. Okay, so uh, as long as we're talking status quo, I don't think there's anybody who is uh, less status quo or business as usual as I am. Uh, I'm not afraid to speak truth to power. Uh, when I began my campaign, like I said, I made one promise to myself, always tell like it is and don't hold back. And 
the response has been tremendous. I began my campaign, just me, myself, and I, my Twitter account. It's been grassroots all the way. And people have come out of the woodwork from all over District 7 and the city to say, thank, thank you, Stephen, for speaking the truth. Finally, I, someone who's, who gets it, who's not afraid to speak their mind and identify the problems that really exist in our city and talk about them honestly and, and uh, frankly. And that, that's me. I'm offering a different approach. I'm offering common sense politics. I'm a no BS. Um, I don't have time for political correctness. I've got time only for real solutions, real talk, and I'm not afraid to speak truth to power and make those tough decisions, unpopular decisions as well. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. And next we'll hear from Mirna. Thank you. Four years ago, uh, we had a national election where a guy convinced millions of Americans that uh, policy experience and legislative experience were unnecessary in governing. And that has not worked out so well for us. So I will tell you that I have uh, decades of experience in uh, public policy, um, and I have more than just uh, opinions uh, about the things that uh, really are affecting San Franciscans. I can show you programs that I've developed and legislation that I have written, organizations that I have worked on um, that have produced results for thousands of families, housing units that have been built and financed. And I think that that actually is what we need. We need someone who has experience, who has relationships, who has been able to do the things that we need for District 7 to deliver services for our community. I hope you support me as your number one choice. Thank you. Thank you, Marina. Next, we'll hear from Kenneth. Hi, thank you very much for having me today. Um, uh, you've heard a lot from all of us once again. I think any one of us would be fine, but I do want to say you've heard platitudes. Um, uh, I also want to say, you know, it didn't take long for someone to bring up Trump as an example of uh, what's wrong when a, a businessman gets into power. Uh, and I just, I couldn't disagree more. I think Trump is an anomaly and he's a problem, but the idea of having some business sense in government is incredibly important. Uh, take a look at the budget, take a look at what people are expecting. Rather than solving our budget crisis, people want to chase revenue. In reality, you need a common sense individual who has a good solid background and understanding what it takes to make tough decisions. What you have is plenty of people with a government background who've been receiving government checks for a very long time who want to continue to do so. So I hope I have your voice and for District 7, your voice, your vote for District 7 Supervisor. Thank you. Thank you, Kenneth. And next we'll hear from Joel. Hi, I'm Joel Engardio. I've lived in San Francisco for 22 years. I've lived in District 7 for a decade. I worked many years as a journalist, and my role was to hold City Hall accountable uh, and give people a voice. I'll do the same as your supervisor. I'm running for supervisor to be an advocate for parents, small businesses, homeowners. I think City Hall should be treating them like customers because without them, we don't have a city. Uh, kids should be able to attend their neighborhood school. An entrepreneur should be able to open a business without roadblocks. People should feel safe living here. City Hall really needs to start focusing on the basics and just getting the basics right. Those are clean streets, less crime, and better services. I have 24 years left on my mortgage, so I often wonder what San Francisco is going to look like when it's paid off. Uh, I'm an optimist. I believe that our best days are still ahead, but only if we embrace what it takes, and that's a combination of innovation and common sense. I'm Joel Engardio. I would love to have your number one vote. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. And next we'll hear from Emily. Thank you so much for this important opportunity to share with you my ideas and platform. Uh, to recap, I have the most experience. I've served this city for over 20 years under five mayors. I managed public budgets throughout this time and was held accountable for every public dollar I spent. I already have relationships with Police Chief Scott, Health Director Greg Colfax, Department Heads and, super, and Supervisors. Uh, twice elected to the school board, I'm the only candidate who's been elected to office. I served as president when the school district put together its long-range strategic plan. And I'm so pleased to report that plan is paying off. SFUSD had a graduation rate of 89% last year, exceeding the state rate of 86%. And importantly, Black students achieved a graduation rate of 90% for the first time. 
Uh, I am supported by State Treasurer Fiona Ma, Assembly Member Phil Ting, Sheriff Paul Miyamoto, former Police Chief Greg Sir, School Superintendent Gwen Chan, and retired Judge Quentin Kopp. I respectfully ask for your number one vote. Thank you, Emily. And finally, we'll hear from Ben. Thank you all uh, for coming this evening. Um, my name is Ben Matranga, and I respectfully ask for your number one vote. Um, I've been endorsed by Senator Dianne Feinstein, California State Treasurer Fiona Ma, um, by large organizations, the Building Construction Trades Council, the Chinese American Democratic Club, uh, former board presidents, Angela Otto, Barbara Kaufman, former District 7 Supervisor, Tony Hall, um, public safety leaders like Sheriff Vicki Hennessy, uh, former District Attorney Susie Loftus, and so many of those endorsements come together because they, folks want somebody who can make the right trade-offs. These are gonna be a series of difficult decisions over the next four years. And some people aren't gonna be happy. You can't fund everything. And what I come to the table with is a life that's been grounded in District 7. I come to the table with a life of delivering on projects for people and creating social good. I come to the table with a set of values that I think create the best scenario where we can actually get move our city forward and recover from COVID. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Okay, on behalf of myself and the League of Women Voters of San Francisco, our thanks to the candidates for participating. And thanks to each of our attendees for taking the time to inform yourself about your choices on November 3rd. It's coming right up. Please remember to register to vote if you aren't already registered and please urge others to register. I just heard today one in four are still not registered. So we have work to do. If you've changed your name or you've moved, you will need to re-register. So please check that. And if you will be voting by mail this year, please be sure that your vote will count by ensuring that your ballot is mailed or dropped off at a polling place or a voting center early, or at least the key word there. <laughs> um, if you have any questions about voting or what's on your ballot, please visit our website, lwvsf.org. You will find everything you need, including our pros and cons guides and our ballot recommendations for this year. So thank you so much, all of you, for attending and participating. Good evening and vote. <laughs>